Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, to organize this great conference. So I'm Kenji Fuzia at NAOJ, and along with Martin, uh, we are going to talk about a uh, chemical link between uh, plant forming regions and our solar system based on isotope ratios of volatile elements. And our team is led by uh, Hideko Nomura-san and includes uh, scientists in a variety of different fields. Okay, so our solar system was formed through the gravitational collapse of the molecular cloud core and the subsequent formation of the disk around the young sun. And in the disk, uh, dust grains grow into planetesimals and planetesimals grow into planets, as discussed in previous chapters. And various molecules, including water and organics, have been detected in molecular cloud and also plant forming disks. And one of the uh, ultimate goals of astrochemistry and cosmochemistry is to understand how molecules are formed in space and how, mo how molecules are supplied to planetary system eventually. And for that goal, uh, isotope ratio of volatile elements are powerful tools. Why? Because uh, isotope ratios are kind of a fingerprint of molecular evolution. And for example, by comparing isotope ratios in objects at different evolutionary stages, we can get insight into uh, molecular evolution during star and planet formation. And since PP6, uh, we have uh, many new observations, such as by ALMA, and also uh, new space missions, such as Rosetta. And we would like to uh, share new such uh, observational results uh, with you. And in the first of this talk, uh, I will discuss the isotope ratios from clouds to disks. And in the second half, Martin will discuss isotope ratio in the solar system. Right. And the key question in my part is, whether this chemical composition is inherited from clouds or are determined inside uh, disks. So this is a key question in my part. And uh, let's start with the very basic of the isotope chemistry. So we have the measurement of the uh, elemental abundance ratio of isotopes in the solar system and also in the local ISM. So they are not significantly different, but not identical, reflecting the chemical evolution in the galaxy. And if, uh, isotope lay, if isotopes with given element behave in the same way in chemistry, we should expect that isotope ratio in molecules should be the same in the elemental abundance ratio shown in the table. However, in reality, uh, isotopes, different isotopes dif behave differently, and uh, we have, and as a result, uh, isotope ratio of molecules can be deviated from the elemental abundance ratio. So this is isotope fractionation. For example, if we look at the crystal core, D2H ratio of N2H plus can reach 0.1. That is four orders of magnitude higher than the elemental D2H ratio, right? So what causes is the isotope fractionation? So there are two main mechanisms to initiate isotope fractionation. So one of the two is, one of the, two is the isotope exchange reaction. And the most important reaction is the most important reaction for deuterium chemistry is reaction between H3 plus and HD to form H3 plus and H2. The combination of the H3 plus and H2 is energetically more stable compared to the combination of H3 plus and HD by around 200K. And due to this energy difference, the reaction in the forward direction, right direction, is much faster than the reverse direction. And as a result, D2H ratio of H3, H3 plus becomes high compared to elemental D2H ratio, and such high uh, D2H ratio of H3 plus propagate into other gas phase species and IC species through so various chemical reactions. So this is the uh, explanation for deuterium chemistry, but in general, isotope exchange reactions move the chemical system into uh, energetically favorable direction. So this is a general rule. And Isotope exchange reaction by isotope exchange reactions are more efficient at lower temperatures because if temperature is high, energy difference between different isotopologues does not matter anymore. Okay, so another mechanism is isotope selective photo dissociation. So let's consider N2 photo dissociation as an example. So if con if we consider a molecular cloud illuminated by UV radiation from the top side. At some depth, uh, UV radiation, which can dissociate 40 and 2, is attenuated. 
due to the absorption by 40N2 itself. So this is so-called cell shielding. And you may know the cell shielding by H2 molecule. It's the same. However, in the case of 50N, 40N, the situation is a bit different because 50N, 40N is much less abundant compared to 40N2. So as a result, in the cell shielding region of 40N2, 50N, 40N is selectively photodissociated producing the excess of 50N atoms compared to 40N atoms. And such high, such abundant 50N atoms can be used to produce uh, environing molecules such as ammonia and HCN. And as a result, uh, 50N enriched molecules are formed. So similar mechanism affect oxygen and deuterium fractionation chemistry through uh, CO photodissociation and H2 photodissociation. So I would like to stress that these elemental chemical processes are uh, well studied in well studied uh, thanks to the quantum chemical calculation and also laboratory studies, right? So there are two main mechanisms uh, to initiate isofractionation, and we can distinguish them by observing the spatial distribution of isotop ratio in the ISM. So this color map shows the uh, chrome density ratio of HCN to HC50N in pressure core L5044, and in this core in the south part. H, the ratio is lower compared to core center and north part, meaning that in the south part, HCN is enriched in 50N. And in this core, it is known that south part is more, south part is uh, efficiently uh, eliminated by UV radiation compared to core center in the north uh, due to the lower visual extinction. So uh, this map is very consistent with that Nitrogen isotope fractionation is caused by isotope selective photo dissociation rather than exchange reaction. And how about deuterium chemistry? So here is a map of the uh, C3 HD emission and the C3 H2 emission in the same core. And if we look at the C3 HD emission, uh, the emission peak corresponds to the uh, dust quantum peak. On the other hand, C3 H2 emission is slight C3H2 emission is offset from the dust continuum peak, meaning that D2H ratio is highest in the core center. So this is uh, uh, different from the uh, nitrogen isotope case. And this means that isotope exchange reaction is the main driver of the deuterium chemistry. Right? And so we can include uh, isotope fractionation uh, reactions into astrochemical model to predict isotope ratios in molecular cloud and also in disks. So here is an example uh, which shows a uh, uh, isotope ratio along with the main budget of each element in molecular cloud predict predicted by um, astrochemical model. And this figure is very messy, messy and pretty our chapter for detail. But uh, basically model predict that deuterium and carbon isotope fractionation occur by the isotope exchange reactions. On the other hand, oxygen and nitrogen isotope fractionation occurred through uh, isotope selective photodissociation with some contribution from uh, isotope exchange reaction. And these are basically consistent with observations. However, uh, we need three more effort for quantity, quantitative understanding link. Uh, for example, a model failed to explain very low 40N to 50N ratio of N to H plus observed in pressure cross. That is the future work. Okay, so let's discuss about water. Uh, we already know that uh, bulk of water is formed as ice in the pristine environment. And after the protostar formation, envelope is heated up and water ice sublimate into the gas phase in region where temperature higher than 100 K. And we can observe such sublimated water by using ALMA and Neumar and measure its d 2 ratio as plotted here. Yeah, class one, class zero sources. So the d 2 h ratio of sublimated water is around 10 to minus 3, uh, which is much higher than the elemental d 2 h ratio. And very recently, our uh, water D2H inside a water snow line of our disk was measured for the first time in outbursting source v ATAG3 ORI and found that d 2 h ratio is similar to a uh, protostellar envelope and also comets in our solar system. And this similarity indicates that uh, water in disk and comets are inherited from the pre stages rather than formed inside the disks. 
And this scenario is also consistent with the model prediction, uh, which traces water DH evolution from clouds to disks. Uh, however, uh, we still need disk processing to explain the D to H ratio of water in comets. So there are variation. So why? So one of the possibilities as follows, uh, in the very inner disk regions, let's say temperature higher than 500K, isobatic change between H2 and water occurred efficiently, reducing water D to H to 10 to minus fifth. And in the outer disk, uh, such isotope exchange reaction is too slow, so uh, water D to H remains to be 10 to minus 3, as observed in uh, protocellular envelope and in disks. And in, in, the, in, the, in the disk, the two water sources with different D to H ratio are mixed via radial mixing, making the gradient of water D to H as shown in the left panel. And so the measurement of water D to H ratio in disk is a key to understand the origin of to understand the origin of uh, cometary water and also comet also meteorites and in the case of v8083 ori disk inner 40 au is optically thick in dust so we cannot observe water in inner regions so we don't know and yeah and observation of class Observation of water D2H in class 2 disk is also very important, but would be very challenging because class 2 disk is uh, cold. Okay, so let's go on to uh, organic species. Uh, here we would like to focus on HCN molecule. So this is a simple organics. And we would like to focus this uh, because HCN is a building block of uh, a more complex organics. And also, more practical, more practical reason is that HCN is one of the most studied species, and HC various HCN isotopologues have been detected in different evolutionary stages of star and plant formation, so that we can uh, track HCN chemistry using isotope ratio. And actually, HCN is one of the most studied species in class two disk in, from the viewpoint of uh, isotope chemistry. And I'd like to also mention that HCN is much less abundant compared to water in comets Abundance is 0.1 percent relative to water, so it so naively speaking, uh, HCN would be much easily affected by chemistry inside disks. Okay, so the, this plot shows the uh, 40n to 50n ratio for HCN in different evolutionary stages. So, so it seems that the 40n to 15 ratio decreases from pristella core to class two disks. And in class two disk, in both in class two disk and comets, uh, HCN is enriched in 50N. So there are some similarities. However, we need uh, some co we need some caution uh, when we compare the disk observation and, and comet because disk observation basically traces gas, but uh, comet observation basically traces ice. But however, uh, the okay. So so let's think about why. Uh, in class two disk, HCN is enriched in 50N. Uh, to, answer, to answer that question, uh, the radial, radial profile of 40N to 50N ratio of HCN in disk are very helpful. So we can consider three different scenarios. In the first scenario, if HCN is inherited from the earlier evolutionary stages like water, we would expect the 40N to 50N ratio is constant uh, across the disk. On the other hand, if HCN is, is formed inside the disk and isotope selectable dissociation is at work, we would expect the ratio increase with uh, increasing distance from the star because the uh, inner disk uh, UV radiation is stronger. And in the third case, if HCN is formed in, in disk and isotope exchange reaction is at work, we would expect the ratio decreased with increasing distance from the star because isotope exchange reaction is efficient at, at, cold, at cold temperature. So this is a, a prediction. And recent spatially resolved observation with ALMA uh, allow us to constrain the larger profile of 14 to 15 ratio of HCN in uh, class two disks. So the top panel shows the HCN emission map for two different disks, and the bottom panel shows the 14 to 15 of HCN 
ratio in two different descriptions by uh, red colors. So as you can see, the ratio increases with increasing distance from the star. And this trend is very consistent with the prediction by uh, isotope selective photo dissociation scenario. So this means that HCN is formed in, in situ in disks, in outer layers of disk being irradiated by UV radiation. Uh, okay, so, and also, uh, if you look at the bottom panel, the 14 to 15 N ratio in disk uh, somehow similar to that in Comet, at least at some positions. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, comparison between disk observation and comets are not straightforward because one sees the gas, another sees the ice. But however, but uh, one can, but one possible scenario is that HCN in the outer disk layers, not the mid plane, are vertically transported to the mid plane and frozen out onto dust grain and incorporated incorporated into uh, comets. So this is just a speculation, but. Uh, but we need a, a model which considers isotope chemistry and transport processes, processes inside the disk uh, to test such scenario. Okay, so special distribution of D2H ratio for HCN was also measured in some disks. For example, Catalogy et al. 2021, which is one of the MAPS paper, found that the special distribution, yeah, they uh, found that the outer disk shows a higher uh, deuterium fractionation ratio, uh, which is consistent with the active isotope exchange reactions inside the disk, and also it suggests that in situ formation of HCN again. They also found that uh, even in the warm region, temperature at around 50 K, D2H of HCN is relatively high, around 10 to minus 2. And if we only consider the H2D plus chemistry, uh, this high ratio is difficult to explain, and we need a uh, warm deuterium fractionation pathway, like uh, shown in the uh, in the slide. And they also found that the uh, DH of HCN in this uh, disks are typically higher, 10 to minus 2, compared to that in Comet, except for in a 50 AU of the uh, heavy gray stars. Okay, so. Certain C fractionation is not well studied compared to nitrogen and deuterium fractionation in disks, but but we have some observation toward toward a T double hydro disk. What we know so far is that the 12 C 13 C ratio for HCN is higher compared to elemental uh, 12 C 13 C ratio. On the other hand, 12 C 13 C ratio for CO is lower than the elemental abundance ratio. And, and recently, uh, Soko Lee and us uh, construct a disk chemical model with carbon isotope, and we, and we found that uh, this trend is consistent with the uh, isotope exchange reaction with carbon to oxygen ratio rather than unity. And we need, uh, we need excess carbon to make uh, that exchange reaction effective. And if we look at comets, uh, comets do not show carbon isotope fractionation. So this is something different from uh, disk observation. Okay, so summary so far, uh, water in disk and comets are likely inherited in the pre stages. And uh, yeah, this observation of the disk around ultraviolet source is very helpful to study isotope ratios because uh, we can see the uh, ice. And ALMA observation, allow us to study a spatial distribution of molecular isotope ratios in class two disks. And these observations suggest that active isotope fractionation chemistry inside the class two disk. And also, uh, spatial distribution, distribution is very helpful to understand the origin of molecules. And finally, we need a model which consider isotope chemistry and transport process simultaneously to connect gas observation by ALMA and uh, commentary observation. Okay, so now go ahead, Martin. Okay, thank you very much for your son. Okay, great to see so many people still here. I should go quickly though, I think. Um, <coughs> so, hmm. something's missing off the bottom, never mind. <coughs> 
Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, it's my job to round out this uh, amazing conference, uh, completing our journey from the giant molecular clouds to the smallest bodies in our solar system. Um, Kenji uh, Froyasan did a, a great job of explaining the fundamental fractionation processes that occur um, in uh, interstellar clouds and protoplanetary disks. And uh, it's my job now to uh, go on to explain how those concepts can help us uh, interpret isotopic observations of various different solar system bodies. Now, as you probably uh, know, uh, ob observations of protoplanetary disk midplanes are extremely uh, challenging, even with the most modern telescopes. So uh, we, we uh, have to go over to um, techniques of observing our objects in our own solar system using, for example, um, uh, remote sensing of uh, planetary atmospheres and comets, um, rendezvous interception and in situ missions to uh, solar system bodies, and uh, finally laboratory analysis of samples either collected and returned or delivered to us within meteorites. Um, so uh, comets uh, and indeed um, carbonaceous chondrite uh, uh, meteorites uh, provide us with some um, very pristine samples um, of the processes that occurred during our early, early solar system and its evolution. Um, they're relatively uh, little modified um, and so therefore we can investigate their isotopic compositions to gain uh, insight into processes such as the um, in fall of interstellar matter into the into the disk. Let's see if I can get a laser. <coughs> no. yep, there it is. It's very small. Um, uh, yeah, chemistry within the disk in terms of gas phase iron molecule as well as grain surface chemistry, uh, photochemistry that we've been hearing about, and also the fundamental um, physical dynamical processes such as radial and vertical mixing, which can. Uh, mix things up in different and potentially unexpected ways. <clears throat> so one of the landmark um, measurements in this uh, field of study was the Giotto mission to Comet Halley, measured the D over H deuterium to hydrogen ratio in water in a comet for the first time uh, through mass spectrometry and uh, obtained a value which was significantly enriched compared to uh, the sun and the giant planets and also pretty much everything else in the solar system. And the uh, D over H ratio um, was uh, found to be pretty consistent with observations of uh, water in uh, D over H in protostars at the time. So this hinted at a significant amount of interstellar material being incorporated directly into comets, which was quite exciting. Over time, we have built up um, a diversity of uh, of comet measurements. We've got 12 different comets and a few upper limits that have D over H measured by now. And uh, we see a, a significant spread in the values. Um, these are the comets in green. I can't see this laser pointer at all. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, basically what, what, what I want to highlight here is that comets do seem to be enriched in uh, deuterium compared to the Earth's water. Um, but there is genuine diversity among the comet population. Some have more deuterium than others. And in fact, um, a really interesting study by List 2019 found that you could correlate the D over H ratio in comets with the active fraction. And that is to say, how active, how productive is the comet compared to the size of the comet? More productive comets are uh, producing more water as a result of icy grains in the coma. So what this appears to show at face value is that those icy grains and chunks, which are discovered uh, abundantly around some comets, but uh, some comets don't seem to show them at all, those icy grains may, may have a, a different D over H, a lower D over H than actually the bulk nucleus. So this may be uh, evidence for two different um, reservoirs of water being incorporated into cometary nuclei. The statistics are a little bit limited. However, at the moment, I would say more studies are needed to really investigate and confirm this trend and, uh, and understand it. Okay, so moving over to look at the nitrogen um, fractionation. As Kenji said, uh, nitrogen can be fractionated by uh, a couple of different mechanisms, but um, what you see here on the left is the uh, pre-stellar cores, which show um, in some cases, defractionation, loss of the, the, the heavy nitrogen in some molecules, whereas some molecules are slightly enhanced. Protoplanetary disks. 
Nope, can't see it. <laughs> Protoplanetary disks um, uh, show a definite enhancement, quite a strong enhancement in the 15N, the heavy nitrogen, the result of isotope selective photodissociation. And that seems to be carried over pretty well into what we see in the comets in our own solar system. They show a pretty similar D over H. And it's actually very uniform. If you want to talk more about comet D over H, come and see me at my poster. It's probably a bit late for that now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you want to talk to me more about that poster, I'm happy to sh show it to you. Um, and uh, so as we move towards the sort of inner solar system, I guess, uh, more towards where the meteorites are coming from, we see that the, um, the 15N seems to be getting lost somehow, or at least less enriched. And finally, the planetary atmospheres on the right show a broad diversity of 14 to 15N, which uh, the origin of which I'll talk about later. The oxygen isotopic fractionation is another story that uh, helps us uh, provide another piece of the puzzle on the origin of the materials from which the Earth um, and other planets formed. Uh, we have, before Rosetta, we had a pretty uh, uniform distribution of um, 16 to 18 O values, um, clustering around the terrestrial value of 500. But what Rosetta did was really uh, blew things apart and showed us that uh, there could be very strong uh, oxygen isotopic fractionation in some molecules, like formaldehyde and the sulfur-bearing species, um, and even in O2. So that provides us with an interesting conundrum and uh, something to attempt to go at with our models. Um, but actually, uh, you can explain in the interstellar mediums, this kind of strong uh, oxygen-18 enrichment through 18O um, ion neutral gas phase exchange processes. Anyway, uh, the, the, the overall picture here, I think, is that we have, a, at the moment, a, what appears to be a re reasonably good sort of semi-quantitative understanding of the deuterium, uh, the nitrogen, um, and the oxygen abundant, uh, isotopic abundances in comets. What we seem to be seeing is that there's a, a significant uh, reservoir of uh, interstellar uh, deuterium-rich water that's maybe being mixed in with um, some slightly uh, less deuterium-rich water, perhaps uh, closer to the, the, the proto-sun. And that's also consistent with our picture of comets built up from the stardust samples, where we see these high-temperature minerals, these, these uh, crystalline silicates formed at high temperature, mixed in with uh, the, the um, material accreted at much lower temperatures further away from the sun. Um, the 15N fractionation uh, in cometary volatiles is similar to that found in disks, and this is uh, therefore consistent with um, isotope selective photodissociation of N2 in the protosolar nebula. Um, and these 18O enrichments, as I said, consistent with 18O exchange at low temperatures in the, um, in the cold gas along with some isotope selective photodissociation of opt optically thin C18O to liberate that uh, 18O and give rise to enhanced 18O abundances in some of those um, species that we observe. So I'm gonna move on to talk about meteorites now. These are, are really fascinating um, and it's not my area of study. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna try and distill an entire field of research down into five minutes. Uh, I'm bound to make a few um, mistakes, so I apologize for that. <coughs> so um, the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites uh, provide us with uh, a record of um, the material that was accreting in the solar system just a few million years after its evolution. Uh, we could tell that from the isotopic ratios. Um, these uh, carbonaceous meteorites uh, accreted silicates, metals, organic matter, and uh, most of them also accreted quite large amounts of water, now, um, uh, as well as the complex organics. Um, now, because of the heating, as it, uh, explained by uh, Steve Desch in his talk, there was uh, 28, 26 aluminium contained in these, um, in these asteroids, and this allowed the larger ones particularly to, to get very hot and melting the water and uh, leading to aqueous alteration and some thermal alteration um, of these materials. So if we look at the D over H ratios in meteorites, um, Connell Alexander uh, led a significant uh, body of, of work to analyze the the water content in meteorites. There's no water left uh, in actual 
sort of liquid form in these meteorites, but they leave behind a lot of hydrated minerals and clays in the meteorites. And analyzing the D over H in those tells us what the water was doing. And you see over here on the left, um, the, the meteorites, the carbonaceous chondrites are plotted in green. And uh, they show a significant spread, but uh, predominantly values clustering around um, the terrestrial value. Um, and uh, in, in some cases, a bit lower. Um, so what's going on there? It appears like, yeah, we've got this D over H uh, rich water being incorporated and likely being mixed in to, to, to varying degrees with uh, isotopically equilibrated water from um, closer towards the protosun. But there's some outliers here, uh, and it's quite peculiar to see so, uh, ordinary chondrites and the rumorutes very enriched in deuterium. And uh, this can be explained as a result of aqueous alteration. In fact, if you react water in the liquid phase with iron in the meteorites, you release H2. The H2 fractionates strongly with the water. And uh, you get deuterium poor H2 being released while the water in the meteorites ends up becoming progressively deuterium enriched. So that explains uh, what we see there. Meanwhile, the organics upon aqueous alteration actually become less deuterium enriched because they're undergoing DH exchange with the, the relatively deuterium poor water. So we go from this case of the uh, very deuterium rich organics in 67P and then aqueous alteration in the disk gives rise to uh, this sort of spread and, and reduction um, uh, as we increase the aqueous alteration and reduce the amount of hydrogen. <coughs> The, uh, the, the nitrogen in meteorites tells a slightly different story of the organics, but it, uh, again, it's consistent with um, what, what uh, we believe is the paradigm um, with, of isotope selective photo dissociation in comets, um, providing the, the source of the nitrogen. And we have a spread of 14N to 15N values. Um, many of them cluster around the, the, the terrestrial value. And uh, this diversity is probably as a result of um, yeah, variations in the 14N to 15N ratio in the disk uh, as a result of these sort of uh, isotope selective photo dissociation effects, which are radially dependent, as Kenji showed in this talk. So we can explain this kind of diversity um, through those models. Uh, the uh, oxygen 18 and 17 isotopes tell us the story of the water and the silicates in the, the solar system. Again, the values cluster around the terrestrial value, but they all lie along this mass-independent fractionation mixing line. Mass-independent fractionation means that the degree of fractionation of the 17O and the 18O is uh, pretty similar and doesn't depend strongly on the mass. So the more fractionation uh, we have in one, we have more in the other. And so this kind of uh, mass-independent fractionation implies the mixing of uh, material enriched in both 17O and 18O isotopes. And this uh, can be explained as a result of production and enrichment in both of those um, uh, isotopes of oxygen after so our, our good old friend isotope selective photo dissociation of CO. And then if we get this 18O enriched uh, water and mix it down into the proto uh, planetary disk mid-plane, it can then undergo isotopic exchange um, with the silicates to produce the enrichment that we observe. So I'll just try and round things off with a discussion very quickly of the planetary uh, atmosphere um, observations. Um, here we see four examples of planets with uh, pretty substantial atmospheres and therefore some of the easier ones to study. Uh, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Titan. If we look at the isotopic enrichments in deuterium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, we see that particularly deuterium, things vary really wildly and uh, this is basically showing us the effects of the uh, ap uh, atmospheric loss of the light isotope. Um, the nitrogen uh, story is a bit more complex. And I'll get on to that. So Titan provides us with a really interesting example uh, case to uh, investigate what's going on with the nitrogen. Um, here we see observations from Cassini and Alma of the different isotopic ratios. Um, in various molecules on Titan, in Titan's atmosphere. Um, well, we, see, we don't see a whole lot of fractionation in the carbon, so uh, as 
tends to be pretty uh, common throughout the solar system. Carbon-13 is not very uh, enriched or depleted. Um, G D over H is fairly close to the terrestrial value, but there does seem to be some fractionation going on in Titan's atmosphere. Um, <laughs> I need to speed up. Yeah, so uh, that may be a result of uh, uh, preferential loss of H atoms compared to D um, during uh, uh, or, or, or uh, fractionation during photo dissociation of methane. Uh, and the nitrogen is the really interesting one, and this shows uh, a quite a strong enrichment compared to the terrestrial value, and is quite similar to the comets, the, the 14 and the 15M ratio, and therefore shows us that uh, the ice was formed in a, probably a similar way to the cometary ice, or comes from a similar reservoir accreted within the Saturnian subnebula. Um, we end up with isotopic uh, enrichment of the photochemical products on Titan as a result of uh, isotope selective photo dissociation of N2 in Titan's upper atmosphere. So the, the nitrogen 15 molecules, uh, atoms get released into the gas phase preferentially, and then incorporated into Titan's photochemical products. Um, we then have to consider uh, loss of those products to the surface through precipitation, and also loss of the uh, 14N at the top of the atmosphere. These are some ALMAR observations I did showing those uh, isotopologues of HC3N. Very quickly, Mars, well, this is a, another great example of these processes in action. There's some data obtained from ground-based studies with uh, the Keck um, and uh, IRTF telescopes. The D over H value on Mars is extremely high. It, it varies from typical values of five to 10 times terrestrial. Um, whereas, actually, it seems to be depleted, um, relatively speaking, at the poles. And this can be explained as a result of preferential sequestration of the heavy water at the surface. So there's a slight difference in the uh, condensation temperature of deuterated versus non-deuterated water. And that means that the heavy water tends to freeze out more readily at the winter poles. And that can explain this um, diversity. But the overall very high D over H on Mars is a result of this uh, dramatic loss over uh, billions of years of Mars's uh, atmosphere and preferential loss of the light, light isotope. So we have to consider all these processes if we're going to understand uh, the evolution of um, isotope ratios in planetary atmospheres. Here's just an overview uh, of many of the different escape processes that differentially affect um, the heavy versus light isotopes. We're talking about loss preferentially of the light isotope and then preferential sequestration in many cases of the heavy isotope at the surface. So we have to consider the balance of these processes if we're ever going to wind back the clock to get at the original isotopic compositions of planets. I'm not going to talk about this. We know JWST is great. It's going to do great things. Um, the spectra are going to be amazing. Uh, so. Another missing figure. Um, yeah, I think I'll just leave my summary up there. I've, I've spoken long enough already. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Trying to wrap this complex story up in, in such a short time. Um, the floor is open to questions to both uh, Kenji and Martin. Can you please line up behind the microphones? Yes, please. Let's start there. Yes. Uh, Hello. Um, yes, it's a question about the second part of the talk, and if you could show a slide the 24 on the, the nitrogen isotopes. Uh, it relates to uh, a little bit what I talked about this morning. Ah, uh, maybe uh, you had a slide with the uh, nitrogen isotopes uh, in the pre-solar cores and pre-stellar cores. Yeah, that one, disks. Um, and uh, the, the question is really how do we accrete uh, uh, nitrogen on Jupiter and Saturn. And I see that in disks uh, you have um, values here that are quite low. And I was wondering where they are measured. Is that in, uh, uh, in solids? And uh, if, if it's the case, do you have the possibility to measure that in very cold disks which where N2 would condense? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if the uh, exact form of the nitrogen incorporated into Jupiter is well known. 
Um, I could say that no. these uh, values here that you see on this plot, uh, were these, do you remember that where they're from exactly, Kenji? These are HCN, the disk. Yeah, yeah so these are, these are the HCN. Um, so yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't exactly know how, how Jupiter uh, accreted its nitrogen, but I assume that a lot of it was as N2. Um, so maybe the, this, this ratio in disks is not representing the, the bulk gas, it's representing just the, the isotopically enriched gas in, in the organics. So to make sure this is HCN vapor, but coming from the solids, uh, so, so it's enriched. Um, it, it, I think it's produced in the gas phase. So, so that, that HCN is uh, coming from the disk surface layer of HCN. Okay. So not the solid in the mid plane. Okay. So that is not representative of the bulk uh, composition, I think. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so we, we jump to that side, please, in the back. Yeah. Hi, Canberra Schwartz, MPIA. My question is for Kenji. So you mentioned that in protoplanetary disks, the D to H ratio of the gas tends to be higher in the outer disk. And you also mentioned that the primary deuteration pathway involves reactions with ions. So do those two things together mean that ionization is likely higher in the outer regions of protoplanetary disks versus the inner? What do you think? So yeah, I didn't uh, say such kind of thing. So <laughs> okay, so please go back to the figure. So what I said is uh, in, the, in the outer disk region, what is just inherited from the uh, protocellular envelope or something like that. So there's no uh, chemical processing inside the disks for outer disk. Not for water, for the more complex gas ah. phase species. Ah, okay, HCN case, you mean? Yeah, so, so in this case, I just think that the temperature is colder in the outer disk region, so that is the only reason why uh, outer region is what outer region shows outer region shows higher D to H compared to inner disk region. Okay. And we don't know the ionization rate from uh, this observation, I think. So Evie, please. Evie van Dishoek, Leiden. Uh, so thanks for uh, putting all this information together. That will be uh, very useful as a, as a response to check. I was actually interested in your new results on the 12 CO over 13 CO in this, and especially how you can get this rather puzzling low uh, uh, value that is also now being observed in uh, planetary atmospheres um, of 12 CO over 13 CO, which is uh, on the low side rather than on the high side. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the, for the, for the low 12 C, 13 CO over CO in disk, uh, we need, it, we need an isotope exchange reaction mm -hmm. with, yeah. with carbon toxin ratio rather than unity. But is this in the mid plane or is this in the disk surface layer? Because so I think it's uh, just, uh, just above the CO snow surface. Oh, and so you don't know yet what it is going to be in the ice? No, which, we don't know. Uh, planets yeah. may be built. No, okay, no. good, thanks. That will and be interesting to, to study as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and in the, in, the, in the link to the planetary atmosphere of, of Trevor C. Sutton's ratio, so in the three double hydro disk, is carbon abundance carbon abundance is very low. So I do not think there is a direct link because uh, carbon is poor in this disk. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We move all the way to the right. Mordecai Maclo, AMNH. So uh, we're comparing five giga year old uh, planetary system here to modern protostars. Is, has there been sufficiently low galactic chemical evolution and radial drift of the sun that that's a legal comparison? Or are these variations actually just telling us that we moved to a different neighborhood at a different time? So, uh, yeah, so we need to take care of what is the uh, elemental abundance ratio. And, yeah, we need to care, care about the difference of the isotope ratio between the solar system and the current uh, ISM. And so we can go back to this one. So, uh, so if we uh, consider the D2H ratio, uh, it's, it's 
two value is close, and if we and the the enrichment of D to H ratio is order of, of the order of magnitude, so the difference between the two is negligible, I think. And the most prob problematic thing is the nitrogen. So, yeah, abundance ratio in the uh, current ISM is much lower compared to uh, solar system. I think this is uh, this reflects the galactic evolution, as you mentioned, and also the movement of the sun in the galaxy. So. Yeah, so the, the direct comparison of the absolute value of 14 to 15 ratio of molecules between uh, solar system and uh, ISM is not not good, I think. So, uh, but but we can compare the let's say uh, the factor uh, how to say the difference between the elemental abundance ratio and molecular isotope ratio. For example, if uh, if the molecules in the ISM is Factor of 3 n niched in 50 n, and uh, comets in the solar system is also show the similar enrichment factor. We can say that something similar occur. I think that is my uh, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have another question over there. Uh, Masanobu Kunitomo at Kurume University. So I'd like to ask the, the time evolution of the bulk D over H ratio of accreting materials onto the protostar because deuterium burning is very important for the protostellar evolution. And uh, yeah, in the outer disk, uh, deuterium is trapped in the icy uh, dust grains. So uh, if pebble accretion uh, rapidly uh, drift, I mean, uh, pebble accretion occurs, then uh, deuterium is uh, efficiently transported into the uh, inner disk and uh, and the uh, accreting materials would be enriched in the deuterium, and uh, in the late phase, uh, protoplanet is formed and the uh, pebbles are uh, blocked, then uh, accreting materials would be deuterium poor. That was my speculation, but uh, is, it, is it true or? Uh, okay, so the point would be the, uh, how much fraction of deuterium is uh, locked up in H2 and water. And uh, so the, based on the uh, protostar observation, we know the D2H ratio of water is 10 to minus 3, and a water abundance relative to H2 is on 10 to minus uh, 4. So it means the, a lot, the most of deuterium is in H2. So I think uh, so I say the effect of the uh, lateral drift of dust grain is not so uh, significant, much less than the factor of 2 or something like that. Ah, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, we have one more question in the back there. Okay, thank you, Susan Mumford, University of Bern. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on why you argue for isotope um, exchange reactions for carbon um, instead of um, photo um, chemistry, um, because there's now more and more evidence that the sun is also isotopically light in carbon, so we would need a process that very effectively fractionates carbon um, between the solids and the gas phase. So, so what, is, what is the, so I do not answer what, what is your point. So carbon isotope exchange reaction is also important for carbon isotope fractionation, you mean? Well, it could be. I mean, that, that's why I'm trying to understand why you argue for low temperature chemistry mm -hmm. instead of photochemistry for carbon fractionation. Or you, you even said that there was hardly any carbon fractionation in the solar system, which I believe is not true. Mm. Yeah, I don't know why the uh, solar system body do not show significant, significant carbon fractionation, but mm, so yeah, we will discuss later, I think, yeah. Okay, Sorry. I think they do actually. If the sun is at around 120 and then the Earth and other bodies are at 89 or so, uh, the comet is even a little bit lower then uh, we would have some significant fractionation. Yeah, thank but you. we can discuss later, thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, that could be the difference between solar system and what astronomers think is significant. <laughs> let's see. Um, so I, I don't see any more questions, so let's thank the speakers again for a very nice talk. Thank you very much.